we close the... Uh, well, good, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Atlanta Council, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here today. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm the director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here. And it's my real pleasure to kick off this panel discussion and the U.S. launch of Security in Northern Europe, Deterrence, Defense, and Dialogue. It's the newest Whitehall paper from the Royal United Services Institute. We are really delighted to be hosting this event here and to be joined by an outstanding panel of experts from both sides of the Atlantic, including our own distinguished fellow, uh, Sandy Virchbau. I'd like to extend sincere thanks to our partners at the Embassy of Norway um, for making this event possible. Certainly, the reemergence of great power competition has altered strategic thinking among Western powers, with Russia's aggressive actions in Northern Europe being of particular concern to the alliance. Russia's resurgent military has expanded its activity in the high north, as many of you know, building defense infrastructure along its Arctic coast, modernizing its submarine fleet, fostering tension and instability through airspace violations and undersea operations near key communications cable links between Europe and North America. Yet certainly NATO has not stood idly by in the face of these developments since 2014. NATO has committed to collective defense in Europe and begun deeper cooperation with its partners, Sweden and Finland, across the board, but especially in the north. NATO allies have made real progress in increasing their defense budgets and developing more effective defense capabilities and erecting a more effective defense posture. That posture includes NATO's enhanced forward presence, four multinational battle groups, which stand ready in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland as a really important deterrent force and a symbol of NATO's continuing transatlantic bond and commitment to defend its member states. Today, NATO's Trident Juncture exercise in Norway kicks off with all 29 NATO allies, plus partners Sweden and Finland operating coherently in Northern Europe and sending a message to would-be adversaries that NATO is prepared to meet the challenges in the region However, the challenges still remain for NATO in Northern Europe. And so I think a key focus uh, of today's discussion is what steps should NATO take to continue to address Russia's military reinforcement in the high north? How can NATO continue to maintain a free and secure North Atlantic that is safe for commerce, for communication? And what role should the United States play in maintaining security in all of those tasks? And so with these challenges in mind, I'm really honored to welcome our panel of experts, several of whom have traveled across the Atlantic to be with us, uh, including some old colleagues. And so I want to really extend our sincere thanks to them. I can think of few better people than Svein, Ef Svein Efjestad, uh, Ambassador Verschbau, Rolf Tomnes to address these really important issues, and our own uh, Kathleen McInnes, uh, our senior fellow, to lead the discussion. Uh, before our panel begins, I would like to welcome our introductory speaker, uh, also an old colleague and editor of this volume, John Andreas Olsen. Thank you, too, John, for coming across the Atlantic. He is a colonel with the Royal Norwegian Air Force and is currently serving as defense attache at the Norwegian Embassy in London. He's also a visiting professor at the Swedish Defense University and a non-resident senior fellow at the Mitchell Institute. He has had a distinguished career, having served as Director of Security Analyses in the Norwegian Ministry of Defense, Deputy Commander at NATO Headquarters in Sarajevo, and the Dean of the Norwegian Defense University. John Andreas, it's great to have you with us to set the stage for this conversation. Before I turn it over to you, I want to encourage all of you to join the conversation on Twitter by following at Atlantic Council and using the hashtag StrongerWithAllies. Once again, thank you for joining us for, for what I know will be a fascinating discussion. And please join me in welcoming John Andreas to the stage. Thank you, Barry. I appreciate uh, the great cooperation between our two institutions and our two countries, past, present, and future, if I may say. And thanks for hosting us today. It is great to be, to be back. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this book uh, in front of you uh, focuses on Direction North, a region that has regained an urgency not seen for at least three decades. 
Russia has re-emerged as the dominant factor for defense planning. This stands in contrast to a couple of decades of out-of-area operations and counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. In short, Russia's rhetoric and actions gives us reason for concern. In early 2014, Russia illegally annexed Crimea and sponsored separatist activity in eastern Ukraine. It still does. It is a confrontational stance not aligned to our Western values. Moscow's significant number of forces on high readiness, reinvestment in high-end capabilities and dual-use infrastructure along the Arctic coast adds urgency to those concerns. Kremlin's military modernization program with emphasis on long-range precision weapons present a major distress for all of Europe. Many of you are familiar with the bastion defense concept. As you see on the map, Russia needs sea control of the inner bastion to defend its nuclear submarines outside the Kula Peninsula, maneuver freely in the Barents Sea, and protect its forces and bases on land. In terms of strategic depth, it needs sea denial down to the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, the Giuk gap, Heightened submarine activity in the North Atlantic challenges open sea lines of communication between North America and Europe and the ability to provide transatlantic reinforcement in a potential conflict. Russia is not 10 feet tall, but let there be no doubt, Russia must be the dominant factor for our defense planning. So that is the challenge. This new book is about how NATO, North America, and the Northern Group nations should respond. In an attempt to summarize the book's message in one slide, I offer the classic ends, ways, means framework as point of departure. And the first question is, what is our end state objective regarding Russia? The big picture is that we would like to have a strategic partnership with a peaceful and prosperous Russia. It requires that Moscow is aligned to democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law the basic values outlined in the NATO Treaty from 1949. This should be our long-term objective and therefore the guideline of our strategy. Second, the book suggests a strategy based on NATO in 3D, deterrence, defense, and dialogue. NATO must consider defense in the context of today's political military realities, covering the full spectrum of nuclear, conventional, cyber, and hybrid dimensions. Defense includes updated contingency plans, a command and control structure fit for purpose, and an exercise and training regime that strengthens interoperability, readiness, responsiveness, resilience, and sustainability. However, NATO members must also seek a constructive dialogue with Moscow through bilateral and multilateral engagements aimed at finding common ground for coexistence in line with a rules-based international order. And third, the means to empower NATO in 3D is burden sharing, with emphasis on the three Cs, cash, capabilities, and contributions. To ensure continued US leadership and commitment, European allies must increase their defense spending, invest in new weapon systems to ensure that each country has relevant, sharp, high-end capabilities, and we must also contribute to fighting terrorism and handling migration, human trafficking inside and outside Europe. This is NATO's 360 degree philosophy. So although this model is simplistic, it suggests a comprehensive approach to establishing a theater-wide defense and security framework for Northern Europe as a whole, one that includes NATO's two key partners, Sweden and Finland. That is how we can be stronger together. That is the way forward. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us move to some of the case studies in the book. I am pleased to introduce the moderator of today. Kathleen McInnes is a non-resident senior fellow with the Scovcroft Center of Strategy and Security. She currently serves as a specialist in international security for the Congressional Research um, uh, Service, writing on defense, US defense policy and strategy issues. And prior to that, she was a research consultant at Chatham House in London, working on NATO and transatlantic security matters. I cannot think of anyone more qualified to guide us through the seminar today. Kathleen, the floor is yours. Thank you.
thank you so much for uh, coming this afternoon for what promises to be a very interesting discussion on a, a critically important topic. Um, as Don Andrew said, uh, my name is Kathleen McGinnis. I am a senior non-resident fellow here at the Atlantic Council, specialist in international security at the Congressional Research Service, which is a government organization. So any views that I express are my own and not that of the United States government. Um, we have an, inc an incredible panel assembled today. Uh, distinguished experts and practitioners assembled to take a strategic approach, approach to um, a critically important aspect of NATO security, NATO's high north. It's an area where, as the manuscript discusses, NATO could be tested in some profound ways that cut to the hearts and seams of between civilian and military relations and, and how we operate together as an alliance. And militarily speaking, I can't believe I'm about to make this joke, um, it's the polar opposite of what we've been doing in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I made that joke, okay. Um, today, each of our panelists is gonna take a couple minutes to share their thoughts with us on how to balance the three pillars of their overall approach, deterrence, defense, and dialogue, uh, both as individual nations as well as part of multilateral groupings, including NATO. If not properly executed, these three pillars can actually undermine each other if you think it through. So how do we do so? How do we do this in a way that's synchronized and effective together, um, again, in this critically important region? Uh, so today we are joined by Svein Alstad, who uh, is the policy director of the Norwegian Ministry of Defense. Uh, Rolf Thomas is uh, the professor and head of the Security and Defense in Northern Europe program at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. And of course, uh, Alexander uh, Verschbau, uh, my former boss in the Pentagon, is a distinguished fellow here at the uh, Scowcroft Center, and of course was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from February 2012 to October 2016. So I can't imagine a better group to walk us through these issues today. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to you for five to seven minutes of remarks, and then we're gonna have about 30 minutes of, of a guided Q&A, and then open it up to your questions and thoughts and ideas. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to you, Sven. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And um, it's great to be back here in, in Washington, this, this uh, forum. Uh, I have written a little piece in this uh, book about the Nordic region. And um, I think there are many different uh, ideas uh, floating around about what is happening in the Nordic region. And I will concentrate um, a little bit on what's happening in the NORDEFCO, the Nordic Defense Organization. I think in today's um, security environment, the Nordic region has a very strategic position because it is the link between North America and Western Europe. And it is decisive also for the security and stability in the Baltic Sea region, where Russia and Europe meets. I will not dwell too long on the traditional differences in security orientation in the Nordic group of states, but simply state that Sweden and Finland are not neutrals the way they were during the Cold War. With their full membership in the European Union from 1994, they took a long step away from neutralism. And if we look at the paragraph 47 and 222 in the Lisbon Treaty, it gives a concrete expression. All members of the European Union will receive assistance and will provide assistance to other members of the European Union if they are attacked. Finland and Sweden have signed host nation agreements with NATO and participate in NATO's response forces and the British-led Joint Expeditionary Force. So all five Nordic countries are increasingly involved in larger scale Western defense and security arrangements. Still, we are three countries inside the European Union where Norway and Iceland are close partners and Sweden and Finland are militarily non-aligned but close partners of NATO through the enhanced operational partnership. Respecting these differences, it still has been possible to develop close military cooperation in the Nordic area. In 2009, Minister of Defense established the Nordefco framework for Nordic defense cooperation, which has three pillars. One is policy, operations and exercises. The second is armament and the third is military capabilities. There are rotational chairmanships at all levels and extensive contacts in all three areas, but no permanent secretariats or staff. Ministers meet twice a year and once every year with counterparts from the three Baltic states. In addition, there is a web of bilateral and trilateral military and defense activities in the region, 
most expressed, I think, by Swedish-Finnish cooperation, but also between other countries in, Nor in the Nordic region. So what have we achieved? We have achieved well-coordinated consideration and policies on most issues regarding the security in our area. We consult and discuss all security developments in Europe with a particular emphasis on the High North and the Baltic Sea region. Together we are able to influence our partners in NATO and the European Union. In addition, the Nordic cohesion gives us a much better basis for handling domestic security discussions. Training and exercises amongst the Nordic military forces have established a good interoperability based on NATO standards. Such interoperability makes it possible to act militarily together on short notice in all kinds of operations. We are preparing to exchange air surveillance data and to establish procedures for alternate landing bases. We are also establishing procedures for early easy access in order to facilitate border crossing without delay. The cross-border Air Force training conducted in Northern Scandinavia has proven to be most useful and cost-effective. The semi-annual Air Exercise Arctic Challenge provide large airspace and excellent training experience for participating Air Forces. Next year, we plan to expand this exercise into a flag-level air exercise. Today, we are conducting the Trident Juncture exercise in Norway and more than 6,000 troops from the other Nordic countries participate in this exercise. We have also cooperated well in a number of international operations in Afghanistan, on the Balkans, in Africa and in the Middle East. Together, we provide capacity building in Georgia. The Nordic countries have very limited resources for deployed operations, but together we can make a difference. We have established secure communications between our five countries. So we use secure VTC for daily work, such as preparations for meetings of different sorts. In addition, we will use this to consult and discuss sensitive issues that may arise in our region. There is also an ambition to strengthen the cooperation in material acquisition and developments in military capabilities more generally. This was originally the major motivation for Nordic defense cooperation, but I have to admit, so far it has produced very limited results. Looking forward, the Nordic countries agree on how we will take the Nordic defense cooperation further. We agree that Nordic cooperation will continue to be a supplement to what we do in NATO, the European Union and other international organizations. It will not become an independent alternative. All Nordic countries will continue to promote closer transatlantic partnership. We will continue to promote opportunities for Nordic non-members in NATO and EU respectively. We will use the Nordefco to strengthen cooperation with the three Baltic states. And with a more complicated and difficult security situation in Northern Europe, our forces focus will be directed towards deterrence and defense in order to provide peace and stability in our region. In this regard, we will also discuss possibilities for more cooperation in civil emergency, total defense and security of supplies. All in all, I believe we are gradually strengthening deterrence and defense in our region. The revitalization of collective defense in NATO is a major factor in this regard. A stronger US involvement through the EDI and a more active UK military engagement are major factors. In addition, the increased military cooperation amongst the Nordic countries is important and necessary. I believe there is a potential for considerable expansion of this cooperation, both bilaterally and in the wider Nordefco forum. I believe in the future, any serious security crisis in Northern Europe will affect all Nordic countries, and we must be prepared to handle such crises together within a wider international framework. This is a good basis for further development of Nordic defense cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Ambassador Fischer. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be a part of this distinguished panel uh, to discuss security and defense in Northern Europe and uh, to help launch the new uh, RUSI uh, Whitehall paper. And I'm very comfortable being surrounded by so many Norwegians today, having been Jens Toltenberg's deputy for, for two years. Uh, the chapter that I co-authored with uh, Mark, uh, Magnus Nordeman uh, 
offers an American perspective to complement uh, the views from different parts of the region contained in this timely volume. And, and I urge you to take a look at the whole book because there's some interesting contributions from Poland, the UK, the Netherlands, uh, other parts of uh, the eastern flank countries. Uh, and I think it gives you a, a very interesting uh, perspective on how different nations view the challenges that we face. Our chapter tries to, uh, starts by reviewing how the U.S. defense and security relationship with uh, the nations of Northern Europe has evolved over time, from serving as the northern flank during the Cold War to becoming a, more of a partnership with a s group of small but very capable nations uh, focused mainly on the conduct of expeditionary operations in the post-Cold War era, that is up until 2014. Uh, today, we've, we've co of course gone back to basics, uh, and Northern Europe has become the most challenging region for NATO as it has uh, scrambled to rebuild and relearn deterrence against a revisionist Russia and to protect NATO's new post-Cold War allies in the region, uh, the Baltic states and Poland. We offer a whole series of recommendations on what NATO needs to do uh, to build on the uh, important decisions from the Wales and the Warsaw summits. Our, our chapter was written before the Brussels summit and we w anticipated a few of the decisions taken there. Uh, our chapter off also offers some uh, proposals for ways to more closely integrate uh, Sweden and Finland into alliance defense planning for the region uh, while respecting their uh, decision uh, not to pursue NATO membership, at least not at this time. Uh, now we, we argue that from a defense and security perspective, uh, Northern Europe consists of two distinct but uh, interlinked regions. The Baltic Sea region, which of course includes both NATO members and close partners, and the Atlantic-facing part uh, of Northern Europe, which includes the uh, European Arctic or, or High North. And these are geographically quite distinct and, and pose different uh, challenges for the alliance. Uh, the maritime dom domain is naturally uh, front and center for the Atlantic-facing part of uh, Northern Europe, while the Baltic Sea region is primarily influenced by uh, the air and ground domains as we, of course, uh, face the challenge of defending uh, the highly exposed uh, Baltic states. I won't go through some of the other kind of retrospective parts of, of the book. I urge you to take a look at the whole thing. Um, but clearly, a, a lot of good things were done under the Obama administration. And, and here, despite uh, President Trump's uh, continued uh, uh, mixed signals as to what he really thinks, uh, whether he believes in NATO, uh, the administration has continued on the path charted by its predecessor and in fact strengthened the U.S. contribution in many ways. More money for the uh, European Deterrence Initiative, more forces deployed in Europe, and uh, continued engagement uh, with uh, the allies in the region, including in some of the regional formats such as uh, working with the U.S., working with the U.K. and uh, Norway on maritime patrol aircraft, the trilateral cooperation which was just given a boost a few months ago uh, when Secretary Mattis hosted his Swedish and Finnish uh, counterparts, they issued a trilateral statement of intent, which on a bilateral basis does a lot of what NATO has been trying to do in the, in the 29 plus 2 framework with uh, Finland and Sweden. So while recognizing a lot of the good work that's taken place, we argue that there's still uh, a lot of uh, additional work that needs to be done by the U.S., by the countries of the region, and by NATO as a whole. And we highlight in particular uh, creating effective and ro more robust reinforcement arrangements for the Baltic states uh, to further bolster deterrence in peacetime and, and increase the defensibility of Northeastern Europe in wartime. And second, to bring the focus back to the North Atlantic in order to ensure that uh, the maritime space remains open uh, for reinforcements uh, from North America in case of crisis or war. Among the steps we recommend, I'll just tick them off in headline fashion, are sort of fully uh, and rapidly standing up the new adapted NATO command structure. Not just the new elements that you've heard all about, the uh, Joint Forces Command in Norfolk, the uh, Logistics Command in Germany, and the new Cyber Operations Center, but making the whole command structure a true warfighting command structure that's ready to kind of go into action with little or no, no warning. Uh, and uh, that is something that all nations have to contribute. They have to contribute and fully, fully man this new command structure. And at the same time, NATO needs to find ways to streamline its decision making because uh, a lag, particularly in a hybrid scenario, uh, in, 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 in responding to fast moving and ambiguous events could be costly. 
in terms of uh, getting NATO's uh, forces uh, staged and ready to, to act if necessary. Uh, we suggest some ways that this could be done. For example, delegating more authority to SACUR uh, to at least alert and stage forces in the early stages of a crisis, even if uh, they, they would need a NAC decision inevitably given the rule of consensus uh, to be employed uh, in actual combat. We suggested some other ideas which, as I said, were adopted at the Brussels summit. Uh, we, we offered a, a version of what became the 430s, having 30 uh, ground battalions, air squadrons, and uh, uh, naval combatant ships available uh, to move uh, in 30 days or less. We urged uh, action on, on a mobility package, which is, I think, a, one of the important new areas of cooperation between NATO and the EU. And we stress the importance of uh, a more robust and frequent pattern of exercises. And of course, Trident Juncture is a, is a good example of NATO's seriousness on that score. Among the additional ideas that uh, weren't taken up, which we think should be considered as unfinished business for the, for the next phase, include uh, upgrading Baltic uh, air policing to an actual air defense uh, regime involving both uh, uh, ground-based aviation, uh, ground aviation and ground-based air defense uh, systems that could be provided by the U.S., by other allies, or uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of coalition of the willing approach. We advocate more uh, effort to counter Russia's uh, growing network of air defense and anti-ship missiles and their ballistic missiles in, in Kaliningrad and uh, the whole A2AD capacity by uh, building more capacity of our own for anti-submarine war warfare, long-range strike, this is something where uh, the Nordic countries, perhaps through Nordefco or through the Northern Group, which is the subject of a chapter in the book, could take the initiative in kind of providing a much more substantial contribution of capabilities for this purpose. We suggest a possible additional deployment by the U.S. of a rotating uh, armored brigade combat team. Uh, this now is being discussed in the context of Poland's uh, offer to host and fund a permanent U.S. base, uh, but uh, we argue, I would argue that the purpose should be to bolster deterrence for the entire region, not, not be viewed strictly as a bilateral uh, U.S.-Polish uh, 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 matter. But a second armored brigade combat team would allow for regular U.S. deployments uh, to the Baltic states, which ironically we were doing in the immediate aftermath of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, but we're doing less as the uh, UK, Germany, and Canada have taken the lead with the EFP battalions in those countries. Finally, uh, I mentioned we offer some ideas about uh, more closely integrating Sweden and Finland. Uh, a lot has been done in this regard, but uh, there's still uh, a lingering element of uncertainty or ambiguity simply because these countries are not members of NATO, not covered by Article 5. and despite the increasing participation in exercises like Trident Juncture and NATO's crisis management uh, efforts, NATO planners will, of necessity, have to always plan for the possibility that Finland and Sweden will not contribute in a particular uh, crisis. And, and NATO will have to uh, generate all the forces from within its ranks uh, uh, just in case. Uh, and of course, Sweden and Finland, uh, as non-members, uh, they're not obliged to contribute, but also they don't uh, benefit from uh, uh, even a soft security guarantee. So we suggest to uh, minimize this uncertainty and create a more coherent strategic space uh, in Northern Europe and kind of blur some of the seams that still exist, uh, that NATO formalize the existing 29 plus 2 mechanisms as, a, as something that could be called a Baltic uh, Security Commission similar to the NATO-Georgia or NATO-Ukraine commissions. Uh, and this could become the main forum for mm -hmm. consultations and decision-making on crises in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, we suggest uh, that Stockholm and Helsinki consider actually deploying troops to one or more of the EFP battalions in the Baltic states, or at least exercise on a regular basis with, uh, with the EFP battalions. And we suggest putting uh, Swedish and Finnish liaison officers at the Joint Force Command in, in uh, Brunsum, uh, and that NATO put liaison officers in, in, the, li liaison officers in the Swedish and Finnish uh, National Military Command Centers uh, as a way of uh, ensuring greater 
synchronization of, of planning and uh, to promote greater mutual understanding of each other's modus operandi in, in a crisis. This would, uh, I think, uh, be seen by Moscow as a, as a factor that uh, would complicate their calculations. I think it would enhance deterrence to the extent that Moscow perceived Sweden and Finland as uh, sort of increasingly part of the team, adding uh, forces and, and strategic depth to the alliance. Uh, and perhaps this would be a transitional step towards uh, even closer integration in NATO down the road. So those are some of the main recommendations in very broad brush terms. Uh, we conclude, of course, by emphasizing the importance on the one hand of U.S. leadership, but on the other of, uh, of greater burden sharing. Uh, I think the, the, the northern allies, through their various regional groupings that they've established, uh, has an opportunity to, uh, to do more to demonstrate uh, that Europe is uh, carrying its weight, uh, and in particular areas, areas of, sort of increasing capabilities for NATO to uh, continue to control the high north, continued contributions of capabilities for uh, the reinforcement of the Baltic states are areas uh, where there is an opportunity to excel for the, uh, the Nordic countries, and I hope they will take that, because I think that is the best way to convince uh, a very transactional U.S. president that uh, maintaining the U.S. commitment is still worth it. Thank you. Uh, Rolf? Mm. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation. It's great to be back. I have written about the European High North, which is also part of the Arctic. And uh, because of the climate change and uh, ice melting, we might see a fundamental transformation of the Arctic, a uh, change of paradigm, somewhere down the road. But it will, it will take decades, basically. So, uh, so today and in the foreseeable future, the main strategic characteristic of this uh, region, the High North, is the prominent role of the Northern Fleet, uh, the strategic submarines, and the, the best in defense, stretching down to and beyond the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, as illustrated in the presentation by Johan Rels, uh, the map he, he, he outlined to you. And uh, just to, to, to emphasize this best in defense from the north, in combination then with uh, what we call the Russia's Arco Steel across. Europe as a whole, stands out as a strategic challenge to the linkage between North America and Europe, and hence to the European, to European secu security in general and to the entire Northern European region. And that is also one of many reasons why we in the future should regard Northern Europe as one strategic entity. As has been mentioned, uh, the US and NATO are about to meet the challenges in uh, the maritime domain, domain. There has been a reference to the, uh, the, the reactivation of the second uh, fleet and the establishment of the Joint Force Command in uh, Norfolk. Then one could raise the question, what could and should be the next steps? And one key question concerns forward operations. As of today, much of the focus is on containing Russia in the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. I see a debate coming where the NATO should, have, should give higher priority to deterring and, if necessary, engaging Russian naval forces in the high north before they enter the Norwegian Sea with significant forces and come into the North Atlantic. Another key and interrelated issue concerns capabilities. Uh, just let me simply touch upon three of them, or three elements of this question. The first one is NATO standing naval forces, which um, have declined over the years and are very small as of today. So then there is the question what to do with this capability. And um, one voice would be that there is a need for a larger high and maritime group or groups within this framework. Or should this be left to other forces, to the strike for NATO forces and other, uh, uh, other, other forces? At least there is a need for such a capability, high-end uh, maritime uh, groups, uh, to take care of high-end forward operations. And of course, the second question is that one of the key priorities for NATO is to regain its advantage in ASW. 
benefiting from technologies such as unmanned autonomous systems, stealth and endurance. And then uh, this there is a question if this is within reach and how to cope with it. What, 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 what are the costs? How should one cooperate within a NATO framework to benefit from this? The third aspect of this I would touch upon is that US Navy will normally have a minimal number of capital ships in, another, in European waters, which leaves the European navies with the prime responsibility for facing Russia in the early phase of a conflict. From such a perspective, uh, the Europeans uh, should do much more together in this field. The question is, is this feasible? Well, these questions cannot be seen in isolation from the more fundamental question, the future of the alliance. It has been mentioned that uh, NATO has come a long way since 2014, and I would emphasize how much has happened since then despite the fact that this is a, is a huge organization, 889, so many people would tend to expect very little from the organization, but much has happened. But at the same time, we have to admit today that we have probably never seen such a level of animosity and unpredictability in the transatlantic relationship. And one will have to ask, and you ask this question every time at this institute, if we see the contours of a deep and irreversible rift in the alliance. But irrespective of who is in position in Washington, I think we have to take more seriously the need for a more equitable burden sharing across the Atlantic. And one could, of course, hope that uh, the current rift could be a kind of creative, destructive force that will reinvigorate the transatlantic uh, partnership if Europe is ready to invest more in defense. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, you, this exceptional sort of overview of your chapters and how the High North is playing such a critical role in, in NATO security. Um, I guess my first question is a bit of a retrospective one, and it's to do with, you know, you mentioned just a minute ago that we've made incredible progress since 2014. And equally, we've made, inc I mean, going from where we've been, you know, doing operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and doing expeditionary warfare to where we are today, if, if you can look back and say, what, what's been the most significant challenge? I mean, this, it's extraordinary that we've been able to come so far, but in, in, in it's moving to where we are at today with Trident Juncture and this refocus on the high north, Again, what, 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 in your view, has been the most difficult part of this process, and what can we learn from that? Rolf? I'm surprised that uh, the Alliance has been so successful, taking into consideration uh, the expectations we had 10 years ago. I mean, when Norway launched its Near Abroad initiative back in 2008, there wasn't much support for that idea. The initiative dealt with uh, re-establishing a better balance between inner era and outer era. So, uh, I'm as a, to, to underscore that uh, I'm very surprised that one could reach so much and so good results in the course of a ten years perspective. But then I'm an historian by training, so I think I, I, I tend to think in ten years perspectives, and that's another modus than what is the case um, at the think tank, to put it that way. It, any, any, yeah. Well, I, I think also we have come a long way from, from uh, 2014. We have established a command structure, so there is a military command <laughs> responsible for any given area. Uh, if you go back in time, it was impossible to point at a command or a commander responsible for the planning and execution of operation in an area. Secondly, we have established quite good um, contingency planning. And by establishing the cont contingency planning, we also have an opportunity to exercise the plans. And when we do so, we can also identify shortcomings. And um, it was much more difficult before when we had the guidance of two plus six operations. 
but when we see an operational plan, we, we can uh, much more easily identify shortcomings. What is still lacking is, of course, the depth, uh, the ammunition stocks, um, redundancies, survivability. There's a lot of problems which will take a long time to mend. Uh, readiness is not good enough yet. So there's a lot of things to do and invest in. But I agree that both we have come quite a long way. I agree with both uh, colleagues. And it is striking how unprepared we were when 2014 hit. We should have been more prepared because the Russians did uh, launch the war in Georgia in 2008. Uh, we did at least <coughs> declare we were going to start paying attention to collective defense. And we even drafted war plans for the Baltic states and Poland. But it was all kind of pro forma. Uh, we didn't get serious. And we discovered that uh, two decades of, of substantial disarmament, removing you know, the last US tank from Europe, reducing to two brigade combat teams from uh, more than 20 uh, at, at the time uh, the NATO-Russia Founding Act was signed in late, the late 90s, uh, put us in a very bad position to, uh, to rebuild collective defense. But it is impressive that we kind of made do with what we had. It was a bit of a shoestring operation at first with the VJTF and some of the first steps taken at the uh, Wales Summit. But uh, steadily uh, you know, we got our act together. And uh, even with small numbers of forces, I think we have made a credible deterrent with these uh, battalions in, in, uh, in the Baltic states. And I agree that the command structure uh, is, a, is a very important development. It doesn't get as much recognition because it's a little abstruse for the, for the layman. But, uh, and we had substantially downsized that in, 20, in 2010. I think you were part of the senior experts group that, uh, officials, senior officials group that uh, did that. And suddenly it was simply <laughs> not uh, robust enough for, for real large scale operations against a peer competitor. Uh, so uh, there's still a lot of work to implement that. But uh, I think all the basic components are in place, but there's still some gaps and plenty, uh, plenty to do uh, over the next few years. So that sort of leads into a uh, next question I had about, uh, and Spine in particular, in your, in your chapter, you note that the Nordic governments do not see Russia as a threat, but realize their national defenses and readiness posture must improve, and adaptation to these new threats must proceed accordingly. And so it's, it's, it's interesting that we've made this progress, recognizing that th there's a tension there. How, how have you explained this argument to your publics and, par and, and been able to move forward and make this progress, given that tension in the argument? Or do you see it as tension? I often get this question. And <laughs> I, I think it has to do with the way we defined, define uh, threat. Mm. Because the, the military or the official definition of a threat is a capability and an intention. And intention can change overnight. And um, we don't have any reason to say that Russia has an intention to attack us. We don't think so. But there could be scenarios and circumstances in which we might be attacked. And therefore, we need a credible deterrence and defense to avoid that to happen. That is the essence of deterrence. And um, there is a risk. There could be circumstances in which a, a conflict could, uh, could break out. Uh, I think most dangers would be a situation in which there would be a misconception, mis misperception that um, that we are not able to act together. And if we lose the cohesion of the West, I think the chances of conflict is arising very fast. It is slightly complicated to, to say it this way, but um, I think that's, that's how we see it. If you'd like to join. Yeah, I think uh, you know, deterrence is about ensuring that the adversary can clearly see that the costs of aggression would, would outweigh any benefits. And I think we have, even with the small battalions in the Baltic states, uh, the Russians know the overall capacity of NATO is, uh, is quite overwhelming. And we are now demonstrating, even as we speak, that we can uh, mobilize uh, more quickly than was the case uh, just a couple of years ago. What worries me is, is are the non-military forms of Russian aggression that we've been witnessing for the last few years. That's where I think we still have work to do to more effectively counter cyber, uh, hybrid warfare of all of its kinds, uh, subversion, disinformation, uh, which can uh, undermine the stability of our societies at much lower cost than, uh, than Russia using its formidable military capability. So uh, 
uh, we have to think about how does deterrence apply to these hybrid threats uh, as, as successfully as we have been doing to the more old-fashioned kinds of deterrence. Um, Rolf, uh, turning back to your piece, and, and I, I suppose to you know, let's find the, uh, the Norwegian perspective, um, and, and picking up on this thread of hybrid uh, warfare, um, the Svalbard Islands have, a, have an interesting legal status, um, which I was uh, privileged enough to go on a, a trip with the Atlantic Council there a couple of years ago, and, and having that explained to us in a bit more detail um, was, was interesting. Um, there's also been recent articles in about U.S. Uh, increasing its uh, footprint through further investments in um, airfields and other, uh, you know, um, aspects of uh, Norway's military infrastructure in order to do pre-positioning and so on and so forth, which has been met with arguments from Russian interlocutors of um, how that's illegal. And so th there's been a bit of back and forth about the legal status of a lot of these different things and a lot of these different issues. Do you, do you see that as as becoming increasingly challenging moving forward, or? Well, as a, to start and to point out the obvious, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Svalbard belongs to Norway. There is no doubt about that. There is the treaty, and it has been signed by 45 plus minus states. Mm -hmm. So the sovereignty question is, uh, there is no doubt about the sovereignty question. Then there is the, the history related to Svalbard, and uh, I've always been of the opinion that <coughs> Russia in particular has not fully accepted the, the realities of this sovereignty, and that they are asp aspiring for uh, bilateral solutions, condominium, uh, related to, to, to Svalbard. And also that they are trying to challenge us uh, every now and then when it comes to, to the Norwegian position up there. Um, not necessarily to the extent that they are prepared to escalate high up the leather party, but uh, to test our nerves, whatever it is, in such uh, situations. Um, I'm not uh, that concerned about uh, the future of Svalbard in the sense that since it is under Norwegian sovereignty, it is solid under Article 5, and the Russians will know that if they should try to um, challenge us up there, it will involve NATO. And it is up to Norway to clarify that. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the alliance also to clarify that that is the situation. And my starting point is that the, 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 regime, the regime in Kremlin is reasonably rational based on its own premises. So they will understand uh, this kind of communication. Mm -hmm. did, you, uh, did you want to add anything? Or? No, I, I agree with that. I, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned about, okay. about that. Uh, but this is something that we, we have a very strong focus on. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that uh, we handle any tendency, upcoming incident uh, early on. And um, no, I, I agree. We also know that the NATO's command structure, NATO's structure, has now a much better situational awareness. Mm -hmm. So if you go back 15 years in time, they were not at all aware about this part of the world. Now they know. Right. Um, the, the Nobody main seen any little green men so far? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, the manuscript itself makes a number of references to uh, the, the political military patchwork in the high north um, and the Baltics of informal and inf uh, formal and informal alignments of the countries there. Um, but there, there's a tension there uh, between regional versus NATO priorities, which is which is which is explicitly rec recognized in this manuscript. Um, in your views, especially when we've just been talking about these issues with depth of capability, um, what can we be doing to um, balance these the the need for these minilateral or uh, uh, capabilities to act together with NATO solidarity and, and being able to act as as a whole alliance, especially with these issues of depth. Uh, Ambassador Rishbaum, do you yeah. have any thoughts on that? Well, I touched on this before, and uh, I think mm -hmm. NATO has been doing a lot, and the, and the Swedes and the Finns have been actually the yeah. you know proactive in trying to get more I inside the, at least inside the door, if not a uh, full seat at the table, uh, because they recognize that they have a shared security interest in uh, working with NATO to deter the Russians. Uh, 
from any aggression against them as well as uh, allies in the region. And I think they've seen that by consulting, planning, training, exercising in a visible way with, with the alliance, both improves our ability to actually operate together, but does send a political message to Russia that uh, even without the formal Article 5 guarantee, they are sort of de facto members of the club. Yeah. Still ambiguous, it still leaves some sort of risks of uh, disappointment that either, either you know, NATO can't count on a particular kind of contribution in certain scenarios or Sweden and Finland may feel neglected by NATO. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's always going to be a difference between being a member and a, and a partner, uh, but I think there are ways to more f closely integrate and formalize this, the, the kind of uh, connections that we've established now to at least uh, discourage the Russians with, from thinking that there's a wedge sure. that can be driven between the alliance and uh, Finland and Sweden. Okay. And then we'll let the national debates continue to evolve <laughs> in the two <laughs> countries. Um, and I'd like to turn to something that I think is uh, of interest to an uh, increasing number of people in this town. Um, but it was, it was touched upon in the manuscript um, a, a little bit. Um, but what of China's increased presence in the Arctic? And and how did that how does how is that playing into your thinking about the future of the high north and and activities there and any thoughts on on that is is what we're doing there sufficient to be able to grapple with that? You're closer. <laughs> well, if I could start, and you can add to to what I'm. Saying. I think we, as a, as a time, we should see China's interest in this region as a part of its uh, global aspirations. So there is no, nothing particular about what is uh, going on in the Arctic. It's just an expression of this, uh, the, this, uh, this country globalizing its activities. And this is also reflected in the policy they have uh, presented to us, um, an Arctic strategy that was published in January this year, which underscore uh, their ambitions, which is not uh, dramatic in, in any sense. What I would like to emphasize more clearly is the economic potential, as we see in Africa, whatever it is, which is also reflected in the North. Let me take just two examples. One is uh, how Russia is becoming reliant on um, on, on Chinese um, investments to um, invest in or to build uh, the infrastructure in the north. The LNG activities um, in the Yamal Peninsula is, is, is a good case in point. A very successful and huge project that is expanding further, will expand further in the years to come. Russia will not be in a position to to do this without uh, Chinese uh, money. And with uh, the such um, money, we'll also, we will also see a, a sort of reliance on, on uh, political influence related to this region. But the most, perhaps some the most interesting case is Greenland, I would say. This country with, uh, with such a small and fragile economy, and we have had, as you know, better than me, this discussion over the last months about <coughs> building the airport infrastructure in Greenland, and um, China has kindly offered to 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 pay for that, as you know, which led to the situation that uh, Denmark and with 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 assistance from from the United States has intervened and said we will pay for these. Uh, infrastructure building just to keep China out. To my mind this is an example of what we basically also have seen in, in Africa and uh, some sort of kind of new imperialism, a potential for that in such a small and fragile economy. And of course had they had such a footprint one could easily imagine in the next um, uh, uh, the next step that this might have had political impact you have the tool base there mm -hmm. any other other panels want to 
jump in on that? Uh, we okay. have, of course, noticed that uh, China is very interested in, in its uh, partnership with the Arctic Council. And they have a research station at Svalbard. They have also sailed the Sulong icebreaker through, uh, through the North Pole. And, of course, the build-up of these ice class uh, tankers, which bring natural gas from Siberia to, to the Asian market. They can go through 2.2 meters of ice, as far as I know. So there is an interest there, an increasing interest. And we also noticed that the commander of the Chinese fleet was visiting with the Northern Fleet this summer. But I do not, I think it is difficult to see a major Chinese military engagement in the Arctic in the foreseeable future. I don't think so. Um. And one other topic that I, I wanted to raise, which is definitely on, on, on people's minds right now, is uh, the U.S. signaling of its intention to withdraw from INF. Does, does that impact your analysis of, of, of burden sharing and, and in a transatlantic cohesion in, in the high north? Or not at all? Well, it remains to be seen how this is going to play out. I, mean, I think. Uh, I regret, even though the administration's apparent decision to withdraw from the treaty is irrevocable and it's uh, justified based on the Russians' violation, uh, I think this should have been done in much closer coordination with allies to uh, kind of shape a response that keeps the onus on the Russians uh, where, where it belongs for, for undermining this treaty, but also taking the time to shape a coherent response that uh, all allies can rally around uh, by withdrawing you know, precipitously the Russians are much better placed to exploit uh, uh, the absence of any further constraints and deploy uh, you know, dozens, hundreds, who knows how many uh, intermediate range systems that could uh, threaten Europe and begin to provoke uh, instability that could require a response, but it could be a very contentious issue within the alliance. So uh, again, it was justified, but I think uh, cons consulting with allies, shaping a common approach, uh, still something we, that, that, you know, time has not run out for that, and I hope we would do that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure the, you know, the reemergence of intermediate range systems, uh, on, even on both sides over the next few years, is going to have a this dramatic effect on uh, calculations of deterrence and strategic balance as it did back in the in the late 70s. Uh, but again, uh, it depends how harsh the Russians' uh, counteraction will be and uh, how united or divided NATO proves to be in, uh, in response to that. Oh, with that, I'd like to turn open the floor to your questions and ideas. If you could, uh, there, we've got microphones here. If you could uh, state your name uh, and your orga the organization you're from, um, and speak clearly into the microphone so we can all hear you. Back, back. Thank you. Dan Roper from the Association in the United States Army. Could you, could you provide your assessment on uh, what was alluded to earlier about the offer to potentially base U.S. forces in Poland and how that's got, what the operational impact of that is militarily and then, more importantly, the strategic impact on the alliance. Okay, well, this is a subject of both internal deliberations right now within the administration, which owes a report to the Congress in uh, the beginning of March. And it's becoming a bit of a political football. I want to be, I'll be careful what I say. Uh, I think there's clearly uh, legitimate arguments in favor of a, of a more robust U.S. presence in Europe. I mean, it's great that NATO has stepped up with the uh, four multinational battalions and other capabilities. Uh, a lot of good burden sharing. So the Russians know that if they were to try anything, even a limited land grab, they're going to run into all of NATO and not, uh, not just uh, Latvian, Lithuanian, or Estonian uh, forces. Uh, but these Abet battalions are, are small. They have limited capacity to hold out in the event of a true surprise attack. So having more capacity to reinforce, to bring forces to the front more quickly, recognizing that there's still enormous logistical and infrastructure 
challenges that uh, will take years to, uh, to remedy, uh, could argue for more troops either in Poland or, or throughout the Baltic uh, Sea region. Uh, and there's many different ways that you could bolster the capabilities we are putting in place now. For example, more enablers closer to the, 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 the you know, potential theater of operation, more you know, air defense units, uh, mobile artillery, uh, pre-positioned equipment and stocks and ammunition of all kinds so that the, you're shortening, shortening the response time for the Alliance. Uh, but I think that this is going to be a contentious issue within the Alliance you know, for those who fear that this could prov provoke an action-reaction uh, cycle with the Russians. Uh, some may argue that it's going to push the limits uh, to the breaking point of uh, the restraint that we undertook 21 years ago in the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Uh, not to deploy, permanently deploy, substantial combat forces uh, on the territory of new members. So it's got complex political aspects, but there certainly are lots of good military reasons that you can probably uh, adduce better than I can uh, as to why some additional capabilities closer to the potential uh, theater uh, could uh, strengthen deterrence. Just as a follow-up for that, how is Oslo viewing this development and, and these debates moving forward? I don't think I have anything to add to, to okay. what Sam said <laughs> okay. on, on that issue. Okay. Lorena Skatorek is from Vilnius Institute for, uh, for Policy Analysis. Uh, I wanted to bring up one of the major topics that is in Northern Europe, the question of military mobility. Uh, what is the view from, from, from Nordic countries, say Oslo or, or, or Stockholm, that could contribute uh, to, to alleviating the issue, uh, perhaps some uh, coverage on, 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 on maritime security, on alleviating military mobility? Sorry? Uh, we have a program in the NODEFCO called EC Access, and um, by that program we are cutting down the bureaucratic processes of, of uh, crossing borders uh, dramatically. And um, that, I think, will not only be applicable to the Nordic countries, but also to other countries which exercise in the area. We're also looking at, uh, at uh, improving those procedures for operational uh, deployments, not only for exercises and training. But I think the, the major issue uh, is also investment in infrastructure, in harbor facilities, in railway, in tunnels. I just met with a British uh, colonel on Trident Juncture, and he said 20 centimeters of, of width makes a lot of difference if you're going through a tunnel. And uh, that is just a visualization <laughs> of the problems that we are, we are meeting with new equipment. And we, haven't done this, <laughs> and we haven't done this for many, many years. So uh, to get over bridges, through tunnels, um, rapidly deploying through harbors, things like that is really important. Yeah, this, this is certainly a big, uh, a big challenge that NATO is going to have to face over the next few years. I mean, some of the press on Trident Juncture is quite startling on how the NATO uh, logisticians simply had no idea what the infrastructure w uh, is and, and where the, the potential bottlenecks are in uh, all the new member states in the eastern half of the alliance. Uh, some of this is you know, bureaucratic procedures that can be streamlined so that there's no big delays of crossing borders, but the investments are going to be huge in re rebuilding infrastructure, uh, bringing it up to standard to carry heavy equipment across bridges through tunnels, uh, nations planning for uh, how to contract rail cars and containers in, in, in crisis so that you, you have, have the, the wherewithal to move things, even if you have good infrastructure. There's so many different dimensions of this. And I think that's why it's important that one of the new parts of the command structure is this joint sustainment and enablement mm -hmm. command, which will can provide, a, hopefully, a laser beam focus on uh, this uh, multifarious uh, challenge. And it's also great uh, that the European Union has stepped up here. I think it would be a great symbol that uh, the EU and NATO really are uh, no longer living on separate planets. If uh, the EU, uh, through the Commission, can provide actual infrastructure funding for some of these essential projects, uh, at least in EU member states, uh, even if it doesn't benefit Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Rolf, did you have anything to add? No, okay. Next question. Oh, just wait, if you could wait for the microphone. It's right, right here. The orange. Right here. Mm -hmm. 
Jeff Stacy from Geoplicity, formerly of the uh, State Department. Uh, Sandy stole my EU thunder there. I was just going to ask about that. Uh, maybe in another way or two. Um, today we're appropriately focused on the High North and the NATO alliance, but um, in addition to appropriately being um, heavily Norwegian in our focus today, what about, um, I mean, gentlemen on the stage, uh, could you speak about yourselves with respect to your other High North partners regarding other aspects of the new security challenges in Europe, including things like um, what Poland and Hungary are doing in terms of moving in a populist direction and others, the EU is taking uh, the lead on this. Uh, what contributions could come from the High North in this respect? And even thinking more widely than that about the, the Middle East and North Africa, we have lots of problems there these days. Some are rather obvious, some are less obvious. Um, there's, for example, talk about uh, an, an Arab NATO, and this has been tried before, and nothing much has come of it, but um, the Saudis, prior to the recent controversies, have been pushing things like the Middle Eastern Security Alliance, something that is supposed to grow into something like this, but we do have the, the GCC conflict with Qatar. What do, what do the high north countries think about these things and wish to do about them moving forward? Simon? That is a huge question. Yes. <laughs> a full spectrum question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me just say that um, in the high north, we have some structures of cooperation which crisscrossing all the alliances. We have the Arctic Council, which works well. We have established something called the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, where we all uh, cooperate very well. Uh, there is uh, a discussion in some quarters about kind of exceptionalism. Is it possible to, uh, to have good cooperation in this area uh, despite all the conflicts uh, surrounding us? Um, when it comes to, um, to the wider questions you, me you mentioned, I don't think that the countries in the high north will play a specific role. We, we, are, we have a limited ability to, to operate together on things like that, except perhaps on the donor side for humanitarian assistance. Um, that's what I can say. <laughs> well, I think first a political point about that is, is sort of it's always important to stress the, the need for allies in the North to be paying attention and doing what they can to contribute to uh, NATO's engagement and efforts to deal with threats from the South, just for the sake of uh, solidarity within the alliance and ensuring that the uh, uh, Southern allies you know, do their part for collective defense uh, where it counts in the, in the, in the North. Uh, I think that also means contributing, as Norway has done, to uh, you know, operations uh, such as in Afghanistan over the years. Uh, but. Uh, on the EU issue, I think you know, there are, this, this mobility issue is a sort of a, high, a highly promising area where EU and NATO can work together. But I think there are many other areas where there's room for, for improvement, uh, capability development, where we still uh, don't see a sufficient alignment between some of the latest EU initiatives, uh, such as PESCO and the European Defense Fund. Uh, enough alignment with the NATO defense planning process and with NATO's most uh, urgent uh, capability shortfalls. Uh, there has been good progress on sort of developing a common approach to, at least in theory, to hybrid threats and developing a kind of a coordinated set of toolkits. Uh, but we need to do more to test and exercise that to see whether it really works in uh, in, in, in sort of tabletop exercises. Um, but. Uh, I think there is scope for using regional groups such as Nordefco and, and, and the Northern Group uh, to mobilize more coherent contributions of capabilities in the areas that NATO needs most urgently. Uh, you know, building on you know, the unfinished business from the uh, from the Brussels summit. Uh, 
And one thought that was tried out a few years ago, but maybe it deserves another run, is this uh, idea of a 50% rule, whereby the U.S. should not be expected to contribute more than 50% of, of capabilities in just about all key areas. Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, Nordic countries could sort of mobilize to provide additional capabilities in some of those areas, whether it's uh, you know, ISR, or combat aviation, or heavy lift, uh, above and beyond meeting your 2% uh, mm -hmm. of GDP. Uh, target. I think, again, I talked about a transactional U.S. president. Europeans saying, we're going to provide 50% of these you know, 10 or 15 vital capabilities you know, by the year 2025 uh, or 2030, I'll give you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that could do go a long way to uh, allaying uh, his lingering doubts about uh, the fairness of the deal yeah. that we have in NATO. Well, this brings me to an aspect of the uh, situation in the, in the high north, and which is sometimes difficult to understand uh, from abroad. And that is related to the question if uh, defense and dialogue could be done at one and the same time. And the Norwegian answer here is yes, it can. And we have done so, so for, for decades. We call it the twin track policy, and it was very clear if we go back to the Cold War in the 70s, the intense climate between the East and West in the 70s, it was at this stage when we enter into a gradually deeper cooperation with the Soviet Union at the time about uh, fishery management. And we established a very good um, fishery management at the time. It illustrates that uh, the, the, the idea of tension, military build-up, can go hand in hand, hand, in hand with, with cooperation in, 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 in other fields. In this case, fisher management, but of course we have had it all the time when it comes to search and rescue uh, and things like that. And that is a long-term perspective in Norwegian thinking, and it has been successful, and it is with us today as well. Uh, thank you. Dave Rubinowitz, I'm retired. And uh, right now, a large part of Europe is dependent to a great extent on Russia for its energy sources, uh, oil and gas and such. I'm wondering if the infrastructure is in place or is being developed to allow North Sea resources to supplant the Russian, to replace the Russian uh, resources as needed, because if Europe is dependent on Russia, that really reduces the effectiveness of deterrence from military point of view. Rolf, would you like to start? Well, we, we had the same discussion in the early 80s with the Reagan administration. And the answer is basically the same today as it was at the time. Uh, one, the size of the resources in the North Sea and in Norway is relatively small compared to what is needed to, to, to compensate for, for a substantial reduction in, in Russian uh, um, import to, 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 to Europe. And the second one, if one should invest I I more heavily in, 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 in the oil and gas sector, let's say, um, of Norway, it will take many years be before um, these resources would uh, would come uh, call, uh, reach Europe to put it that way. So it is basically no principal alternative. Then of course it can compensate for some of it and uh, be part of a package, but that's another thing. I mean, I'm not uh, a, an expert on energy or energy pipeline issues, but I think there. You know, certainly a strong case for finding more ways to diversify sources of supply for Europe, which could include even building new pipelines that could bring what gas production there currently is available. I think there's something called the Baltic Pipe, which is trying to bring Norwegian gas to Denmark and to Poland, that would be at least a small uh, cont contributor to reducing dependence on Russia. And of course, uh, Europe reconsidering the Nord Stream 2 pipeline could, could be another way to reduce dependence on Russia. And I welcome the fact that uh, Germany has recently announced that it's, it's going to look into developing more import capacity for LNG, which could be coming from multiple sources, including the United States, as another way to diversify sources of supply. So it is a strategic challenge. 
It's not something that can be solved overnight. But and as in the case of Nord Stream 2, I agree with the administration that it's a mistake to kind of increase our dependency at a time when we're uh, dealing with such a uh, aggressive and hostile Russia uh, that's forcing us to uh, uh, build up our defenses and deterrence and spend a lot more money on defense as an alliance. I don't think I have much to add to this. Uh, of course, the Norwegian export of gas to Europe, uh, to the United Kingdom, to Germany, Netherlands, to Lithuania, is of course co compensating for a lot uh, already. And I'm not sure there is much more capacity in the Norwegian, uh, in, in the North Sea from our side to, to compensate for that. And there's also a, a question of, of the endurance for how long can we continue to produce this. So uh, I think we are already producing at a very high tempo. And it does, co does compensate to some extent. Question for uh, Roland Henning, uh, Embassy of Latvia. Uh, Norway being a wealthy country, haven't you considered paying, let's say, not paying, but uh, bidding, let's say, some $4 billion to US government to attract uh, greater U.S. presence in, in your country? And in general, is that the pattern for, for allies to follow? Thanks. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understood the question, but... Um, but well, po Poland is offering $2 billion to host uh, U.S. presence in whatever form. They, they were aiming for division. Is that something what Norway has considered? Um, well, well, maybe bidding a little bit more money because you can afford it. Some <laughs> <laughs> financial inducements yeah. for. <laughs> no, we uh, we have not considered that. Uh, we we negotiated uh, an agreement with the United States, I think, in two thousand and five, um, so that we took uh, fifty percent of the operating cost for the priest storage equipment in Norway uh, for the Marines to improve uh, burden sharing in that regard. Further thoughts on? No, I'm not in the ministry, so I can't <laughs> make any offer. <laughs> yeah. I would say that since I'm not a, a responsible government official anymore, uh, it's probably better to make these sorts of decisions based on you know, military requirements and uh, overall contributions to security of the alliance as a whole rather than getting to bidding wars for uh, hosting new, new uh, facilities. That being said, when the U.S. deploys, uh, it does expect uh, robust host nation support, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's perhaps even more the case with this administration. Um, but uh, we should start with the military requirements, how to contribute to our defense and deterrence strategies, and how to uh, you know, ensure that what we do benefits the alliance as a whole. Hi, thank you. So I'm, I'm Clementine. I work at the Atlantic Council. Um, so I have a question about Trident Juncture, which uh, kicked off today. Um, and I know that you, some of you touched on it in your remarks. Um, obviously, it's a huge mobilization of force, like one of the largest that NATO is kind of undertaking in, in decades. Um, I wanted to ask, what are the, some of the areas that you are kind of watching for in terms of what the Alliance will be able to demonstrate in Trident Juncture? Um, with the mobilization of such massive forces and, and, and equipment uh, into Europe and across Europe. What are the key areas that um, you're looking at and what, what do you think the lessons learned will be from it? Maybe um, also testing out the VG, VJTF and, and um, yeah, any other areas that you're watching for? I think there's a lot of potential areas where you can uh, learn lessons from this. Uh, we very strongly favored the transfer of responsibility for exercises from ACT to ACO because it is the Allied Command operation which will actually conduct operations and it is important to plow the experiences from exercises back into the operational command which we are now doing I think. But obviously in terms of logistics, in terms of host nation support, in terms of being able to handle winter warfare. We are, it is only October, 
but we experienced over the weekend a lot of car crashes because soldiers were not used to operate with snow and we had snow also in South Norway in October. It is not easier in January in North Norway. <laughs> uh, then there is a lot of, um, of issues to lesson learned from in terms of uh, interoperability, in communication, in um, uh, supply, a lot of things like that. And I think also we will be able to identify a lot of short shortfalls um, in our systems. In I think also uh, in terms of joint warfare, where the Navy and the Air Forces and the Land Forces will operate together, it is not something we have done very much for the last 30 years. And then, of course, combined warfare, also with allies, uh, between allies, but also with partners. So there are a lot of areas where we can draw lessons from this exercise. Any further thoughts? Yeah. That's <laughs> we'll give the same list we'll be watching, <laughs> particularly host nation support, we'll be watching very closely. Yeah. <laughs> I think but perhaps uh, one, uh, one thing I would like to mention in addition, and that is um, total defense concept. This time we are exercising a lot of civilian agencies which have a role in supporting the military. And um, it is very important that when we do military planning, we also take into consideration the need of the civilian population when we talk about our own population, our own territory. And uh, I think also in that area, we will gain a lot of new insight. Um, with that, we are just about sh um, up on time. It's almost five. And I promised to make sure that our panelists could um, end on time. So I wanted to open the floor to, to you, uh, or take the floor back to you, and give you an opportunity to summarize any key thoughts or um, ideas from the discussion that you wanted to reiterate or just concluding comments. And if we could start with Rolf. And work back? Well, in short, I'm rather optimistic when it comes to the future of the Alliance. Uh, the daily noise, yes, it is taking into consideration what has been achieved in the course of the last 10 years. There is a huge potential for moving uh, forward in, in the years to come. And Titan Junction is just one example of uh, what we are doing by putting yet, yet another uh, puzzle into, into all, all, all of it. And, and we see that every day there is yet another part coming together and uh, building a whole, whole, whole picture. Uh, that comes, that uh, is also related to the if we, we stick to the high north, what is taking place in the cooperation between Norway and allied partners. Uh, we have in place uh, a NATO defense plan, which is extremely important. We are about to, to roll out uh, a, a good command structure, very important. We are developing the bilateral cooperation with the Americans, uh, uh, gradually, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, similar is the case with Britain, uh, particularly when it comes to the maritime domain, and uh, the amphibious cooperation in the north between uh, Norway, uh, Britain, and the Netherlands. So there is a steady movement here in the right direction, but it will take a long time, but uh, again, since I'm a historian by training, if we see this in a time, 10 years perspective, there is a, is a significant change. I too am I'm optimistic. Uh, I think NATO is, is on the right track, even though uh, there's plenty of uh, additional work to be done. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential for groups of countries, including the Nordic countries, uh, to kind of show the way to other allies uh, by coordinating their efforts. We haven't talked much about the Northern Group, uh, uh, but which brings in, of course, a, a, a big ally, the UK as, and the Netherlands as well. I think the Northern Group has the potential to perhaps uh, become a galvanizing institution, not just be a talk shop uh, in terms of uh, perhaps you know helping to form some of the battalions that would 
answer the call for the 430s initiative. Uh, there may be uh, uh, other things that could be done to more closely uh, integrate the, the Finns and the Swedes you know, on a regional level. Uh, but I would just uh, re-emphasize uh, sort of the overarching importance of, of burden sharing as, as part of this. Uh, it's not just because of the domestic uh, situation in the United States and the president's transactional approach. It's also simply a reality that the United States is going to be increasingly uh, engaged in other parts of the world. Uh, obviously, the relationship with China is becoming much more contentious and competitive. Continued challenges in the Middle East and the Gulf regions. Uh, I think that's reason enough for the European members of the alliance to do more to strengthen the European pillar of the alliance and European responsibility sharing within the alliance. Uh, I think we're, you know, we have to re define this issue in terms other than just 2%, 2%, 2%. Uh, but I think uh, our, our study here identifies a lot of uh, particular things that uh, could be the focal point for additional investments, and additional uh, uh, multilateral cooperation that could be a way to get to a, a kind of more balanced partnership within NATO. Perhaps more balanced than we've ever seen over 70 years of existence. Uh, and I think that's a goal worth striving for. Uh, I'm also optimistic. I think we need to continue to invest in uh, sustainability, in readiness, in survivability, because we have not paid enough attention to survivability. We, we are quite vulnerable, actually. And that is also contributing to instability, potential instability in crisis. Um, furthermore, I think that um, uh, the, we also need to pay attention to other issues than the security in the north. We, ha we, must, we must also continue to engage in other crises around the world um, to provide stability there. The, the biggest challenge, I think, in the future is the political cohesion in Europe, actually. That is uh, something which, um, which perhaps is the biggest concern in the long term. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. Yeah, right. no. <laughs> um, I would like to first uh, thank the Atlanta Council for uh, hosting us for what was just a fascinating discussion. Um, and John Andreas, and to the authors, I just wanted to commend you for an incredibly impressive work that brought together so many interesting perspectives on such an important issue. Um, there's copies of the a book, the Whitehall paper, out there. Feel free to grab a copy and share it freely. Um, it's it's, it's really worth reading um, and, and, and continuing the discussion as we move forward um, with, with each other. And also, I'm sure the authors would be happy to talk with you as well. Um, and finally, thank you to all of you for being here and being a part of this discussion. Um, we've got to move forward together. And it's amazing and wonderful to see so many faces and so many people that are interested in these issues and want to move forward together. With that, thank you so much.